how did Krithika do so many jobs in such a young age before becoming a technical project manager? Was that all a lie? Will we still have jobs after ChatGPT? What's the average income of a full-stack JavaScript developer in Canada? Okay, we're getting to the money part. <laughs> so we have recently crossed 10k subscribers on YouTube. And as a thank you to all of you, we are creating this video to answer the most asked questions in the comment section of our YouTube channel. And if you're here for the first time, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Pranav. And my name is Kritika. And I'm a software developer in Canada. And I'm a tech project manager who used to be a full stack developer before. And both of us together run this YouTube channel as the name suggests, Programmer Couple. And we try our best to learn new things and share it with all of you. Let's get to the question. Okay, I'll take the first one. Where are you guys from? Easy. So we're both from India, as you can tell. Or... But to be specific, we're both from Delhi, which is the capital of India. So you can take the next one as well. Where did you go to college or university in Canada? So yes, we both went to the same university in Canada. We went to Concordia University, which is located in Montreal. And the course we did there was Masters of Applied Computer Science. Now the next one is one of the most asked questions on our channel. Can I become a web developer without any formal education? So the answer is yes, you can become a web developer. All you need to do is learn the basics like HTML, CSS, JavaScript. That's the core that will help you with the front end technologies most of the time. And then you can learn maybe Node.js and something in the back end. And what I use to learn all of those, because I did go to bachelor's and a master's university, but you don't really learn these things in college. You learn basics of programming. You usually use in C or Java. Nowadays, Python as well. So I would recommend all to read the documentation and you know buy a course on Udemy or just watch YouTube videos. So subscribe to the channel. So I guess you should take the next one as well. So the next one is can I get job after learning PHP? Very specific. PHP, yeah, and a lot of you ask this and I don't know why. So PHP used to be a very prevalent programming language, especially using the backend before. Now Node.js, Python and Java are taking over, but still we have a few very cool PHP frameworks like Laravel and a few others that are still used. I would recommend that if your goal is to find a job, just don't learn any language in general just for learning it. Look at LinkedIn and search for a technology in your area and see how many jobs it, there are in your area. And based on that, learn the technology you're interested in. And most of the times, what we end up learning is not what we use in, the, in our first job or when we actually get a job. Because I think both of us used to work with Java. But then in our first job, I got to work with AngularJS and Node.js, and I think she also got to work with Node.js, which we had no idea about. So you learn on the job, and to find a job, just search for the most you know, popular language in your region. The next one is, what's the average income of a full-stack JavaScript developer in Canada? Okay, we're getting to the money part. <laughs> okay, the fun part. So it's hard to say the average income for the entire country, Canada, because the average income really depends on the city you are in, because the average income, of course, depends on the living expenses and how costly it is, like, you know, your uh, cost of living in that city. And of course, so, the company and the years of experience also. Definitely yes, of course, own. there's like a lot of factors at play here, your experience, you know, like the company that you're going for, and of course, your negotiation skills as well. So... But like to give you an example, so let's say we're here in Montreal, right? So the average income in Montreal for a full stack JavaScript developer would be around 100K, so 100,000 Canadian dollars. But if you compare this to Toronto, which is more expensive than Montreal, it would be somewhere around 120K, so like 120,000 Canadian dollars. But just to give you a range, because not everyone gets the same number, some get some go higher, some go lower. So I would say the range would be somewhere around 80, 80 to 120. 100, yes. 80 to 120 is like the a good range for one year or less experienced developers. Okay, next one. It's a very loaded question. For beginners, which one is easy to learn, React, Angular, or Vue? Well, my favorite is Angular, so I'm going to stick with that. I'm a Google person. But honestly, all of them are pretty similar. React, people usually say it's easier to start, right? But I learn Angular first, and I don't feel that way. Angular is more structured and has a lot of features, but learning curve can be a bit steep. React is very easy, but as you start building and build new projects, bigger projects, I think React kind of sucks for most people. You have to do data handling in a better way. And Vue is a you know mixture of both. My preference is Angular, so let's take that. And as someone who started learning React first, I would say React is very React is comparatively easier, I'll say yes. Why? Because it's a library. So it doesn't have a lot of things that you mm. would want to learn, right? Or you would need to learn in order to use React. Whereas Angular is like a very loaded framework that, which has like a lot of different features, honestly, that you will need to learn, you know, like if you want to create like a very heavy project with Angular. Yep. So, yeah. That's right. So take it with a grain of salt, but yeah, my favorite is Angular. 
Okay. Okay. Next one, Prana will take the next one. How to become a backend developer? Well, for a backend developer, you absolutely need to learn a programming language, for example, Java or TypeScript, JavaScript or Python. And the essential part of a backend developer is being able to connect front end with back end. So you need to know what is REST API or GraphQL API, some security mechanisms, and then connecting to a database and knowing at least the basics like create, read, update, delete, run operations. So once you know all of that, you can call yourself a back end developer. And then the learning is basically unlimited. So all the best for that. That's always the case, honestly. True. Well, okay. Next one. Have you done MBA? You say you're a manager, right? So people <laughs> ask this question a lot. Have you done MBA? Um, so, the answer to this is very simple. No, I have not done MBA. I have done master's, but my master's was also in computer science. Right. So it's it's actually a very funny and interesting story how I transitioned into project management without an MBA because many people find it like not to be, you know, to be very surprising, basically. So for me, because I'm an engineering manager, right? I'm not like a project manager. What I do is very technical and I manage a team of engineers, so software engineers or, you know, web developers. So for me, I started as a full stack web developer and as I gained certain experience and because I had like good people skills, I used to take initiatives and stuff like that. So I was picked to be, I was picked to be the leader, the team leader of the team that I was working in. So slowly as I progressed, I started learning. I never had any formal training or formal education in project management. I started learning like the specific skills that is actually needed to, you know, like lead or manage a team. Going to the next one, as a technical project manager, do we need to code? Okay, so the answer to this would be yes and no. I'll tell you why. Well, so from what I've heard, I have I think managers are not supposed to. Code, they're not even supposed. You can, yes. Right. So manager are not supposed to, code, but it depends again on a lot of things. So it depends on the level that you're at. So what I'm trying to say is because I work for a smaller company, right? And my because I am a technical project manager, so I already used to code at the time. So when I became a project manager, like you're supposed to manage the team right for example like in my case i used to call it agile practices so i made sure that we i also you know like assume the responsibilities of a scrum master so i had that as well but because you can code as a technical project manager so whenever your team is lacking behind and you need to like push this you know project out on the deadline and stuff so you have to take charge so you have to sometimes code which is not necessarily the worst you know it's a skill that you have and yeah. if you can put it to use for the betterment of the team for the betterment of the organization you're working for it's a great great thing in my opinion and so, as a software developer i can tell you that the best managers are usually the ones who know how to code if your manager doesn't know how to code he or she can be a great manager but they will lack some skills when it comes to a technical company so beware of that ah uh, next one is our nightmare Will we still have jobs <laughs> after ChatGPT? I think a very yes, controversial right? question. <laughs> at least, at least today, I use ChatGPT or any you know similar system almost daily, right? And uh, I use it to help myself code better and basically shorten the search time. I'll give you an example. For example, if I want to search how to like if there's a library in Node.js or is there a library in Angular that can help me do what I want to do? Previously, I had to do a lot of research, a lot of Google search. Now I can just add chat, chat GPT to give me the best library available. So yes, chat GPT helps us. And at the moment, I don't think any technical programming job has been lost because of AI in the future. Okay, so we had a short video or a reel in which uh, Kritika showed how many jobs or different kind of jobs she did before she became a technical project manager. So because of that, a lot of people ask, how did Kritika do so many jobs in such a young age before becoming a technical project manager? So was that all a lie? And that was all true and how that was possible was because most of those jobs were part-time jobs when I was a university student so as you know like when you come to a foreign country you need you know like you need to do a lot of part-time jobs to be able to pay your own bills and sometimes even your college tuition so the next one is is DSA important and how to learn DSA uh, data structures and algorithm uh, DSA is definitely important it's one of the subjects in which most people fail at least here in Canada from what uh, we have experienced but it is very very important and yes people complain that we don't use linked list or you know uh, graphs or trees and day to day programming life which is all true but the reality of today is that if you interview for most companies today they are going to ask you some questions related to DSA right so it's better that you know 
then you don't, right? So this is considered as a basic of programming. Even though you don't have to use it on a day-to-day -day basis, like calculus and mathematics, people will still ask you this and expect you to know at least the basics. Now, how to learn it? Well, there are a few books, like Cracking the Coding Interview is one of the best books to learn data structures and algorithm. There are some other books from universities like Princeton and Stanford, which you can have a look at. But YouTube videos and Udemy courses, again, I would go to them, which are my favorite resource of learning them. And subscribing to our channel will definitely help. And just to add to that point, it also depends on the company, again, you're working for and your role. So if you're working on a mission critical application or a time critical application, you, mu you must know how to write optimized code, right? So at that time, data structures and algorithms and optimization, it will come in handy. What are some non-coding roles for tech people? There's a lot, actually. So if you don't want to code, but you still want to go or remain in tech, you can go into designing. So like there's graphic designers, there's UI UX designers, then there is website designers as well. And if you don't want to do designing, there's other roles as well. For example, solutions architect is a non-tech, sorry, is a non-coding role as well. Then you also have the roles and positions of like being an analyst. So you can be a business analyst and it's controversial, I know, but like some people say that DA or data analysts don't have to code as well because like what they use, the software that they use, for example, like Excel and, you know, Power BI and stuff is they're like technical tools, but they're not, they don't involve a lot of coding. Right. But again, if you use programming languages like Python, let's say, for example, for data analysis, that will include some coding. So but I'll still consider DA as well, you know. So, yeah, there is that. So that concludes all the most asked questions on our channel in the last couple of years. I hope we answer some of your questions and let us know if you have any more in the comments down below. We'll try our best to ask them whenever we can. Maybe at 25,000. Sounds good. OK, so it's a deal. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in the next one.